Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming to my GDC talk, Chaos Theory, the Music of Jurassic World Primal Ops. I'm Winifred Phillips, and I'm a game composer. I've composed music for titles in six big franchises, Assassin's Creed, God of War, Lineage, The Sims, Total War, and Little Big Planet. I've also composed music for projects in massive IPs like Shrek, DC Comics, Toy Story, Speed Racer, and The Da Vinci Code. My book is called A Composer's Guide to Gay Music. It's published by the MIT Press. I also write monthly feature articles for GameDeveloper.com. In this talk, I'm going to be sharing my process composing the musical score for the video game Jurassic World Primal Ops. It's the game from Universal and Behavior Interactive. Jurassic World Primal Ops came out last summer right alongside the theatrical run of Jurassic World Dominion. Does anybody remember that scene from the original Jurassic Park that explains what chaos theory is? Now, Jeff Goldblum is talking about the T-Rex, and he calls it the essence of chaos. And then to explain the concept of chaos theory, he talks about the movement of water droplets to make the point that it's nearly impossible to predict where the water's going to go because it takes a different path every time. Chaos theory is a recurring theme in the Jurassic Park Jurassic World franchise. It's the idea that unpredictability is everywhere. You're constantly off balance because you have no idea what's coming next. You never went no when some big, pointy, teethed, huge monster is just going to jump out of the shadows, and well, that's terrifying. <laughs> After the team at Behavior Interactive hired me to compose the mu music for Jurassic World Primal Ops, we kicked things off with meetings to discuss musical style. We were well familiar with the music of Don Davis, Michael Giacchino, and the other composers in the film and TV franchise, such as John Williams, Don Davis, Michael Giacchino. So we knew that when the dinosaurs showed up, the music was always very intense. The action didn't last long, though. If the humans didn't get away quickly enough, they were essentially going to end up as dinosaur lunch. So the action in the movies and the TV shows had to be fast moving and succinct. In contrast, the game is essentially one long action sequence. So the music would have to be very different. Nevertheless, it was vital that the music allow players to feel as though they're having their own gripping adventure in the Jurassic world. The development team and I knew that we really had to get the musical style just right. In Jurassic World Primal Ops, you are an elite dinosaur handler working for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And dinosaurs have escaped from their captivity and they've spread across North America. And it's your job to capture them and bring them back to the reserve. Now, while you're doing that, you're also engaging in firefights with poachers and mercenaries, so you're constantly in danger. The dinosaurs can eat you, the humans can murder you. Now, to make things even more interesting, once you capture the dinosaurs, you can train them to fight for you. And there's nothing like having one of these two-ton, three-horned monsters to, well, bring on the carnage. With all this in mind, I decided to explore the spirit of chaos theory by pushing the music of Jurassic World Primal Ops as far as possible towards an unstable, dangerous, and chaotic musical style. And that brings us to the subject of our talk today. What does it mean to compose chaotic music? How can we create a musical score that can propel and sustain emotional unbalance over extended periods of time? In this presentation, we'll be taking a dive into the nuts and bolts of composing extremely unpredictable music. We'll be looking at some important techniques from music theory, and I'll be including frequent audiovisual examples that'll help make things clear. In order to feel unstable and chaotic, music needs to accomplish certain objectives. It needs to violate our expectations, first of all. 
So, what would we be expecting to hear? For that, let's check out the game's user interface, including several menus that allow players to prepare for their missions and the game's world map. This is one of the few instances of classically traditional harmonically diatonic music that I composed for Jurassic World Primal Ops. Now, as we could all hear, this menu music is in very traditional major and minor modes with the diatonic chords and their associated tonal relationships. This kind of music feels very reassuring because it's full of classic determinate cadences, harmonic resolutions that resolve exactly the way we'd expect. No surprises here. It's essentially a musical bass line. It establishes the rules so that we can start breaking them. Now, the first chaotic technique that we're going to be discussing today is the use of unconventional modulating cadences, which we're going to be calling tonic pivot. This is pretty much the exact opposite of the classic determinant cadence. Instead of the chords resolving in the way we expect, they pivot, angling us in a new direction, which includes a new tonic, a new resolution tone, which gives us the feeling of a new key signature. The destabilization of harmonic weight is produced by essentially hijacking the expected resolution and propelling it in a new direction. When executed successfully, the tonic pivot is innately unsettling because it disobeys the rules. But we can't just go ahead with this technique without considering our options. We have to be careful because we can't just randomly shift into an unexpected chord and expect that to work. We want to subvert the rules in order to compose unexpected music, disturbing music, not smash the rules and essentially end up with, well, noise. I'm going to play an example of a combat track for you now from Jurassic World Primal Ops that uses lots of tonic pivots so that you can see what I mean. You'll see that I've identified the tonic pivot chords by circling them in red so we can follow along. Notice that there is a random quality to these chords, and that makes the tonal center shift in unpredictable ways. Getting this right in our own compositions involves lots of trial and error, and you'll have to trust both your ears and your instincts when you're trying to create these sorts of effects. In my work in Jurassic World Primal Ops, I experimented with lots of different musical devices to help these harmonic progressions feel a bit more natural. Here's another example of tonic pivot in my Jurassic World Primal Ops score. Notice that these pivots include common tones that help to tie them together. So now let's move on to the second chaotic technique on our list. As we just discussed, we can use tonic pivot to introduce chaos into the way chords move. So let's now talk about how we can use unusual harmonies to feed chaos into the way chords are built. Fun fact, the word chord was originally a shortened form of the word accord, meaning perfect agreement. And that's just what a traditional chord does. It perfectly agrees. Traditional chords are built on triadic intervals, the root, the third, the fifth. The three tones work together to reinforce the tonal center, which gives us an awareness of the key signature. Triads are stable, they're organized, they're 
reassuring, and that's exactly what we don't want. For Jurassic World Primal Ops, I frequently opted to build my chord structures not with thirds, but with fourths. This produces chordal harmonies, which is really interesting. The root, the fourth, the seventh. Chordal chords obscure the tonal center. They're harmonically unbalanced. Chordals lack a sense of major or minor orientation, and this is really useful when we're trying to maintain a level of ambiguity in the music that we're composing. As an example, let's listen to some music that accompanies players while they're tracking dinosaurs across the American Southwest. The style direction for this part of the musical score included guitars and a Southwestern vibe, so that shifted the music towards a more traditional sound. Now I countered that with chordal harmonies that helped to keep things feeling a bit more uncertain. So let's check that out. Chordal harmonies, such as the ones that you just heard, go a long way towards making our music feel unsettled and anxious, but there is more that we can do. For instance, using chromaticism can be a really powerful tool at our disposal. Now here we're letting the music slide through all of the available half steps without regard for either key or mode. Employing chromatics is great for laying waste to our tonal center, leaving behind disorder and turmoil, which is precisely what we want. Here's an example. During this action track, the music moves through an atonal chord progression, and then it rushes into a purely chromatic sequence. Hear how this technique conveys pure chaos. You'll notice that example used unison chromatic lines to drive the nervous excitement of the piece. Chromatics are really effective at reinforcing anxiety during long action sequences, but there are other ways that we can obscure that tonic and make our music feel a bit more tumultuous. Now, as we all know, anyone who casually listens to music is well aware of both the Ionian and the Aeolian modes, the traditional major, and the traditional minor. These modes are everywhere, with all of their well-worn intervals, chords, and progressions, so we've come to expect them. And that's why avoiding these modes is a great way to subvert expectations and create more disconcerting music. In the score for Jurassic World Primal Ops, when I wasn't pushing atonality into my compositions, I was leaning heavily into exotic scales, like the whole tone and the octatonic. So let's take a look at how that worked, starting with the octatonic. Now the octatonic or eight tone scale is a scale that alternates whole or half tones. The octatonic has the advantage of working really well with diminished triads. Well, they're nicely unsteady and they can be menacing in the right context. The octatonic became one of my go-to tools for the Jurassic World Primal Ops score. Here's a very straightforward example from a combat track. Notice how the bass line in this combat track runs through the entire octatonic scale in sequence.
Now, here's a more complex example of the octatonic scale in an action track. Now, while I never ran through the entire scale in sequence here, you'll notice that the bass line is overtly octatonic in nature with diminished chords that are emphasized in the brass section. And I arranged the strings in a conventional minor mode, so that made the entire thing feel a, a bit more unstable and precarious. While I used the octatonic pretty frequently in this project, I also alternated it with the whole tone scale. Now this scale consists entirely of whole steps, which means it naturally feels disconnected to a key signature because it's, it's just hard to determine where the tonic is. First, let's check out a combat example. As you can see, if we're looking for an unbalanced scale with no tonal center, then the whole tone scale is precisely what we need. Also, it features augmented triads, which are also harmonically ambiguous. Now, all of this is great for creating uneasy sounding music. Let's check out another example. This is music I composed for one of the tense exploration sequences in which the player is tracking dinosaur footprints in the wild. Notice how apprehensive this whole tone structure feels. Exotic scales like these are just fantastic for when we're pushing our music away from a classic harmonic structure and towards atonality. But now let's take a moment to step away from atonality altogether and consider its close cousin, polytonality. We're all very familiar with traditional key structures and signatures. In classic music theory, key signatures control what chords we hear, what harmonic progressions may occur, what melodies may take shape. Now, when we go fully atonal, we distance ourselves from all of these rules, but with polytonality, we keep using them, albeit in a more devious sort of way. Instead of hiding the tonal center, we construct our music to assert more than one at a time. When listening to a track that's structured in this way, we can sense multiple separate and distinct key signatures happening simultaneously. And this can create some really interesting harmonic complexity. Now, best of all, the music can include classically diatonic melodies and still feel conspicuously weird due to all of the unrelated chord structures that are happening beneath. Ah, excuse me. I'm so excited by polytonality. <laughs> okay. Deep breath. I want to share some musical examples of polytonality with you now, with the caveat that this stuff can get pretty complicated. I'm going to be going through a bunch of details here, but mostly to give you a general feel for how polytonality works. So let's start by checking out this relatively straightforward example. This is another piece of music that accompanies players while they're tracking wild dinosaurs. I built the music around the whole tone scale, though we already discussed how the whole tone scale worked in the music of Primal Ops. Now for this particular composition, I put the initial chord into the C whole tone scale. <laughs> but the bass line is assertively hitting D flat as the root tone. And D-flat is not at all in the C whole tone scale. Plus half of the foreground melody is written with the assertive D-flat major feel. Oops. <laughs> the and the other, uh, <laughs> let me back that up a little bit. I want to make sure that we get this example so that it works out for everybody.
plus half of that foreground melody, let's actually hear it, is written with the D flat major feel. And then the other half follows the C whole tone scale. Now the chords support this melody by swinging back and forth between D flat major and C whole tone. And that makes the entire thing feel uh, bizarrely unstable. Let's check that out now. You'll see that I've included this notation in the following example with the D flat major and the C whole tone content divided into different staves so that we can track what's happening. Now I want to share a more complex example of polytonality with you now in the music I composed for Jurassic World Primal Ops. We're going to be listening to this music, but again, I'll break it down for you first. The orchestra begins with repeating diminished chords in D minor. The string section gives us some nervous figures in A flat minor. So now we have two simultaneous unrelated keys, D minor and a flat minor. Now after that, we modulate into a hard tonic pivot, which takes the background chords and the agitated string section into chords in G major. Now while that's happening, the melody along with the bass line move the musical construction into B flat minor. So there are lots of polytonality here. So we're gonna get a better sense of it when we're listening to the music. Now, as before, I've divided the different key signature content into different staves so that we can follow along. And you'll see that I've indicated both where the modulation and where that tonic pivot happens. Polytonality such as this is an uncommon harmonic device, just like the tonic pivots, chordal harmonies, chromaticism, and exotic scales we've discussed so far during this talk. All of these techniques help us to break away from harmonic conventionalism. But harmony isn't the only way we can introduce chaos into our game scores. So at this point, let's shift our discussion away from harmonics and talk a little bit now about kinetics. Energy in music is typically driven both by tempo and meter, which gives us a sense of general momentum. There are lots of ways that we can experiment with unusual meter structures. For instance, in that polytonal piece of music that I was just playing for you, there are also abrupt temporary changes in meter, and these help things feel a bit more agitated and unstable. Now, the time signature moves from triple meter to a single measure of common time, and then it moves back to triple meter again. Then it progresses into a single measure with five beats of a regular time before it moves back into triple meter once again. So let's check out how that worked. While well, meter changes like the ones that we were just hearing help our music to stay on edge for longer periods of time, they're not our only tool. Kinetics addresses not only general momentum, but also the energy of sudden movement. In an interview for Total Film Magazine, composer John Williams addressed the importance of kinetics in his music for the first two entries in the Jurassic Park franchise, describing how he had to match the rhythmic gyrations of the dinosaurs. Now, as a composer for a Jurassic World game, I knew it wasn't really going to be possible for me to match the rhythmic gyrations of the dinosaurs. Nevertheless, I could simulate the same effect by employing a technique that I'll be calling kinetic fragmentation. So let's discuss that idea. 
In traditional composition, bursts of movement can be achieved with classical ornamentation, such as trills, runs, repetitions, glissandi, crescendos, and other such of hits, flourishes, and gestures that inject abrupt, vigorous impact into our music. But those are also familiar sounds. And this talk is about pushing our music towards the unfamiliar. Classic ornaments are well organized, they're performed with discipline, and in accordance with traditional harmonics. Chaotic ornamentation, on the other hand, is unruly. It's performed with abandon, and it often incorporates atonal or polytonal qualities. I treated all of these techniques as kinetic fragments that could be injected into my compositions to cause disruptive impact. These kinetic fragments allowed the music to seem as if it had been structured specifically to conform to the movements in the game. They enhanced both excitement and menacing, and menacing qualities during gameplay. They were the musical equivalent of fireworks, or even you could describe it as bolts of lightning. So let's check out an example of kinetic fragmentation in a combat track that I composed for Jurassic World Primalogs. Uh, you're gonna be hearing lots of big orchestral hits in tight clusters, anxious brass repetitions, hectic woodwind runs in multiple opposing scales, forceful trills and flourishes, all coming together to add chaos to the kinetics of the game. In that lead piano that we just heard, there's another useful technique that injects a bit more atonality into the music, so let's briefly discuss that. As you might have noticed, the lead piano line in that piece was heavily inspired by the 12-tone technique. Let's check that out. We start with all the 12 tones of the chromatic scale, but then we avoid any sense of key signature or harmonic center by sounding all of those 12 tones in an apparently scattered arrangement. Using the 12-tone inspired approach makes our lead lines feel a lot more unpredictable, so let's check out another example of that in action. Here's some exploration music. Notice the 12-tone influence in the marimba part. So now we've taken a look at tonic pivots, chordal harmonies, chromaticism, exotic scales, polytonality, kinetic fragmentation, and the 12-tone inspired approach. And that's quite a lot of chaos. <laughs> so at this time, I, really, it's about time we ask ourselves, have we reached the point at which excitement just turns into exhaustion? For Primal Ops, I knew that the musical score just couldn't stay chaotic indefinitely, or it would just get to be too much. Our senses get numb to sensation when we're exposed to intense stimuli for too long. There has to be contrast. I mean, periodically, we just need a break. So let's now talk about how we can provide a bit of order in all of this chaos. At the beginning of this talk, we checked out the music I composed for the game's user interface. Now, this menu music features a clear and memorable theme, and as a contrast to most of the game's music, the menu track is written in a classically traditional style. So um, first, let's remind ourselves what that sounded like. I used this melody to insert some familiar and conventional techniques into the score for Jurassic World Primalogs. And while the melody tends to appear fairly briefly, I also used it a lot. 
Variations of this melody are included in nearly every combat track in the game, regardless of its key, mode, or style. So this means that somewhere during the high energy mayhem of combat, a familiar melody will suddenly appear, injecting some musical clarity into the mix before veering off into chaos once again. So let's check that out. This variation is from a combat track that adds some chromaticism into the treatment of the theme. Now let's listen to a version of that same theme in which the underlying structure moves through a complex chord progression. Now, while these chords support the tumultuous nature of the combat music, the recurring theme provides momentary relief from all the chaos. And finally, let's check out the most overtly traditional example, the reward stinger. This music is triggered whenever the player successfully completes a mission. If ever there was a musically soothing, classically conventional pat on the back, it's that reward stinger. It's the polar opposite of the harmonically ambiguous, if not fully atonal music that typifies much of the score of Jurassic World Primal Ops. And much like a reward, these thematic moments provide a welcome sense of balance to what would otherwise be a, a fairly overbearing, chaotic musical score. Jurassic World Primal Ops needed action music that could maintain a high level of anxiety over an extended period of time. Now, over the course of this session, we've discussed why creating musical instability in our compositions can help keep players feeling on edge. We talked about why determinate cadences fulfill our expectations and how we can essentially hijack those expectations with tonic pivots that can mu move music in more unpredictable directions. We looked at traditional chord structures and how chordal harmonies can make music feel more ambiguous and suspenseful. We've discussed why chromatics obscures a key signature and why exotic scales like the whole tone and the octatonic are so useful in creating uncertainty about the tonal center of a musical composition. We've taken a dive into polytonality to see why this technique and harmonic device create such disturbing effects. We've explored the importance of kinetic energy in our music and how meter changes and chaotic ornamentation can make music feel more exciting. We've learned about the weird atonality of the 12-tone inspired approach. And finally, we've considered the importance of contrast and why traditional tonality can be important even in a chaotic musical score. When Jeff Goldblum uses water droplets to talk about chaos theory in the original Jurassic Park, he tells us that the chaos theory deals with predictability in complex systems. By enhancing chaos over predictability, we can introduce exciting complexity into our game music. For me, these techniques were vital in helping players to feel as if they're having a gripping adventure in the Jurassic world. Thanks very much for coming to my talk today. Well, thank you so much. Um, I, don't, I know I ran a little bit over, so I don't know if any of you would like to uh, ask any questions. We have the room until the, the hour, so you can come to the uh, microphone in the center. And please remember to say your name before you ask the question, please. That would be really great. Thank you. Thank you, Winifred, so much. I'm Brian, and your talks are always a masterclass in presentation, just your graphics in addition to your amazing music. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm always curious as a composer, what was recorded live? And with those aleatoric elements, did you use any particular libraries? And just, yeah, just to kind of nerd out about that for a minute. Oh, yeah. Well, this was a combination of both live and virtual. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a hybrid um, 
or a hybrid score. So there were, uh, it, it, there was a lot of virtual simulation in it, uh, but there was also there were also some like sweetening live elements that were added in later. And oh gosh, in terms of the kind of libraries I use, there are just tons. I, I do a lot of mix and match. So uh, pretty much every orchestral library you can think of, I've used at least a part of it. So yeah. I'm sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, it was Hi, Kate. Incredible talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the music was actually implemented into gameplay. Mm -hmm. Like within all that chaos, how do you then deal with horizontal and vertical remixing and looping? Where do you find spots to calm all that together? Yeah, uh, it was really interesting. It was a fairly simple, straightforward implementation. Uh, Jurassic Pro World Primal Ops is a mobile game, so there were certain considerations and limitations to that in terms of how dynamic the music could be. But we still wanted it to feel responsive to player choice, give a, a sense of player agency. So there were a lot of different outros and intros that were created for each of the combat tracks and exploration tracks so that it could be uh, random uh, triggered depending upon uh, where the characters were going and what they were doing, and you wouldn't get a sense that you were hearing a lot of repetition. Um, the, the music uh, kind of morphed itself into the experience that way, but it wasn't a more, a more dynamically complex implementation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, Winifred. My name is Carl. Um, this is a question about the uh, Jurassic Park IP. To state the obvious, um, Jurassic Park as a franchise is quite a, quite a, um, it's a film music with a, quite a legacy and a pedigree to it, just to st state the obvious. Um, so, you know, a lot of different composers have worked on I mean, films and games and this franchise. So how did you think about that when introducing your unique approach to chaos and music while also being true to the expectations that both the clients and customers are going to have for a Jurassic Park mm. kind of franchise. Can you talk about that a little bit? That's a great question. I listened to a, a ton of the music that had been created for all of the various iterations of, of projects that were in this IP, um, mostly because I wanted to absorb it without imitating it. And, you know, it's like... Sometimes a style can be considered like a vocabulary. And if you can, if you can absorb enough of it and become close enough with it, so intuitively speaking, you can begin speaking in that language without saying the same thing. And that was really what I was trying to, to achieve with the way I approached it. I had a, so much respect for what had been created before. And I wanted the instrumental choices and the, the, the weight of the arrangement to reflect what would be expected from music in a Jurassic project, but I also wanted to bring my own sensibility to it. So uh, it was a lot of it was um, essentially an instinctive way of working, if, if that makes sense. No, that's great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, Winifred. I'm Dan, and thank you again for your talk. And actually, his comment uh, goes well with mine. This is just a compliment. I really enjoyed hearing um, how you were using Jurassic Park motifs and idioms, but without overly doing it as kind of a small, subtle nod to the work that was there without really beating into the ground. So that was really well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very kind. Hi. Hi. So a lovely talk. Um, Thank you. My name is Fergus. I was just wondering, obviously a lot of musical theory comes into this, as we've seen, but when you're when you're writing things, do you think you start with the basis of, I want to write this tone, so I will set about it with musical theory, or do you mm -hmm. write instinctively and then think, I need this to sound more chaotic or mm -hmm. you know, sad or whatever? You know? Well, I think for this particular project, a lot of the, um, the, the basic techniques that I've discussed today are idiomatic of the Jurassic Park franchise as a whole, uh, with perhaps the exception of the whole tone scale, because that just happened to be something I personally love, and it, it snuck its way in. Um, and afterwards, when I was looking at what I'd done, I realized, well, that really isn't... <laughs> But uh, but a lot of other um, other elements did have common ties, and so when I was uh, familiarizing myself with the music uh, from the previous iterations in the franchise, I kind of instinctively absorbed a lot of these techniques, and then felt my way through um, expressing them with my own voice. 
Um, so I, I don't think at the time I was thinking, oh, now I'm doing the 12-tone technique or, or now I'm going to be working with kinetic fragmentation, things like that. I wasn't, I, I hadn't put the names on it, but that was what I was doing. I mean, when we're here and we're discussing these sorts of musical choices, we need a language to be able to communicate with each other so that we can share what we did. But a lot of what we're actually doing is very um, intuitive and, and subconscious when we're creating music. And then later we look at what we did and realize the complexity that's working underneath the surface. I mean, these are all techniques we're using, but we may not have given them the, la the labels that they have now and that we use when we try to share with each other. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I think that uh, we're all wrapped up here. So again, thank you so much for coming to this talk and please remember to fill out the session evaluations and um, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.